Hey guys. All right, we're recording. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the Container Identity Working Group meeting for September 22, 2017. Um, so on the agenda today, we've got uh, Tao Lee from Istio, uh, who's gonna give us kind of an overview of, a kind of quick overview of what actually Istio is, and then sort of dive into kind of the implications of how we'd like to, kind of Istio is a use case for this identity system that we're trying to build essentially. So um, they're, they're provisioning certificates, so um, we we would like to be able to have them as kind of a, a plugin of, of as a, uh, one of the plugins that, that will work with this identity system that we're that we're um, that we're talking about. So um, I'll hand it over to Tao. Um, okay. To take so that away. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay. So the, first of all, I want to give uh, some Istio review of before uh, we dive into uh, Istio auth. So Istio is an open platform to uh, connect and manage and service and secure a service. So it provides a feature like uh, load balancing, service to service authentication, monitoring, logging, and it has, a, it has a control plane and data plane. So control plane, as you can see from the above, we have a pilot which is doing discovery service. Make sure it does uh, authorization and policy control. Is to ask, just do the also stuff. And uh, in the data plane, we have an uh, Envoy, which is developed by uh, Lyft. And uh, we, we call it Istio Proxy, which is an extended, extended version of Lyft Envoy Proxy. So this is a high performance proxy developed in C++. And uh, we use this to uh, mediate all the traffic including the inbound traffic and outbound traffic to perform all this uh, uh, monitoring logic <coughs> logic, and also like a uh, OS um, load balancing stuff. Uh, so this is what Istio does. So Istio OS is overviews like uh, Istio OS try to provide a strong identity to each service that represent this, uh, re represent the rule uh, to enable interoperability across the uh, cloud in the cloud. Um, and they still ask also to uh, secure service to service communication. They provide a key, key identity system and to automate the key and assert generation, distribution, rotation, and uh, revocation. So, and, one question I was going to ask do you see that um, the certain identity for services is only for services that are Istio enabled, or? Would other services that aren't using the proxy be able to participate in getting a cert for things like TLS serving or for client identity? Well, that's a good question. Uh, for for, for our, right now, we're at our point to release. As of a point to release, uh, uh, we only let the um, proxy talk to proxy. So, um, so external service or other non istio service, you're not able to talk to us in in, in TLS or mutual TLS. But we do have an actual item to uh, enable this, um, which we targeted for Q4 because. Um, Is that really true, though, Tao? Because um, Istio Auth will create a TLS cert for every service account, kind of regardless of whether that service account is participating in the mesh. Well, that's um, right now we're doing it within the same cluster, uh, the service account. Uh, within the same Kubernetes cluster. Yes. But, yes. Um, Services that are not part of the Istio mesh, mm -hmm. if they have a service account, will still get a TLS certificate from Istio Auth and could, in principle, uh, use those certificates uh, to identify themselves to services in the mesh. Well, um, in, that, in that sense, um, I would say yes, yeah, yeah, you can do that. Um, but right now, what we have the problem is that. Uh, when we have the traffic from the kubelet, which is like a do house check, a kubelet is pretty hard right now for to for kubelet to get our Istio certificate, mm, and also for outgoing traffic like uh, from pod to API server. So uh, API server doesn't have our key insert. Um, but what you say is right. Yeah. If, uh, well, if, and and we actually have been talking about this and other in SIGOTS as well for things like Prometheus. Yeah you're only exposing a TLS protected endpoint, how would Prometheus trust that? Um, so 
if I understand correctly, the integration today could be abused. You guys have some plans to do that. Um, maybe this is a follow-up topic that we just queue up, which is, does every Kubernetes service have the, the, the right to a service identity? Um, maybe not under this working group, but we could you know, come back to it. I didn't want to derail it, but that's, it's really important to us because like, without the ability to get a cert that other people can trust, you basically have a toy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll throw one more use case out there that I know about too. Like bits of Calico um, kind of want to authenticate to each other um, using a mechanism like this. Uh, and so, yeah, it would be, yeah, that, that's, I, I think we have, I think we have a number of examples of like, even like fairly core Kubernetes bits wanting to have service to service TLS that they don't really have at the moment. Okay. okay. Thanks. So, uh, so here's the overview about the how is the OS works. Um, we have uh, four steps. Step one is a MTLS handshake. And when the client side receives the server's certificate, we will do a secure naming check to uh, first for the server's uh, cert identity. And server will also do a similar thing to do authorization check. After each size, uh, verify each, uh, the, other one, the other side. So we can do uh, data transmission via T metric TLS. Uh, by the way, as you can see that the same field we're using has a prefix like a spiffy colon slash slash. So spiffy is like a, a new industrial standards. Different services can talk to each other um, securely. So it's a scope like uh, has a serve format and key, key serve distribution. And for now, as for now, um, it's to just uh, leverage the same certificate format. Quick um, question. Do you sure. depend on the DNS at all or no? Is uh, the naming completely decoupled from DNS? Uh, yes, yes. Because okay, it's the same field, with a URI actually. Okay, because I think in the first example, one of the scenarios that we always see is that coupling between Cube offering DNS for services and Cube being able to authenticate who gets secrets for those services, which is another part of that use case. So we can take it up later. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, this one is how we do identity provisioning. A left part, as you can see, is what we do for point one, which is about uh, four months ago. And uh, everything was in the same cluster, Kubernetes cluster. So for Kubernetes cluster, we just use a uh, the CES centralizedly generate a key and certificate based on each service account. Um, and we do, we use a volume mount, and I mean, we use a volume mount to write the secret into, to mount into each pod. So they got, that's how they got a key and certificate. And the right part is what we do uh, for point two, which is uh, we're gonna release like um, end of this month. And uh, this scope of point is to extend the existing service from a Kubernetes cluster into uh, to support VMs. Mm. So in the VM, the way we, we got a key and certificate is kind of different. Uh, we have a node agent, which is a, which is a process running uh, in, at each VM. And this guy just a generate key and a pair, uh, public key and private key pair, generate CSR, and send it to the CA, get a certificate, and then, then put it to the Envoy. So this is a different way how uh, to generate the key and certificate. So in this way, apparently the private key will never leave the node. And uh, that's, that's what we do for VM now. And uh, going forward, we might, um, I think we want to uh, use similar approach or like a flex volume thing to, for, for the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so just one uh, point of clarification uh, for people on this call. Uh, when Tao says that we use a, a volume mount um, for the Kubernetes uh, containers, um, it's a, a Kubernetes secret uh, mounted as a volume. It's not like a flex volume or, or some custom right, right. Like right volume now, driver. Yes, right now we use a Kubernetes secret. So. And, and unlike the, um unlike the container use case where we could legitimately say that the pods come and go, but we, we wouldn't want a secret for that. I mean, do you, do you feel that the service identity lifetime would have to be, would have to live somewhere, no matter what, live on some central server so that other pods could get access to it? 
I mean, like service identity. Right now, we're using the Kubernetes service account as the uh, identity of each. Uh, uh, Sorry, I, I meant the generated secret. The the secret that you have today, no matter what, you would need to store it somewhere in order for multiple nodes and multiple proxies to have access to it. Right, it's storing etcd. Right, and so I think that that gets to the um, we should at least queue up the topic of when we do need to store secret data that needs to be in a different security domain from normal secrets. This is a use case where we're kind of stepping outside of container identity in theory, because container identity, we've said, you know, that has to be, or ideally we would deliver that without relying on secrets in Kubernetes. This is a case where the data that is stored is a secret and that someone consuming and using it needs a place to store it, whether it's a vault or Kubernetes secrets or a Kubernetes third-party resource definition or something. And so that combination of circumstances means there's use cases that Kubernetes needs to help deal with for people who may not have a vault. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have to have it, have the certificates be long-lived um, things that are independent of the container. You could imagine a system that looks more like the VM bare metal side where when, when it comes up, it generates its own private key and um, that key is then signed uh, just for the lifetime of the pod. Okay, and, and we talked about that for containers too, so, okay, thanks. Okay, so let's move on. So this one is our plan for identity provision in the next release. Basically, all the secrets will be generated by the control plan and delivered to the workload via a node agent. So in the control plan, we have uh, six components. Uh, the the I registry API is for admin or orchestrator to a register identity to the identity registry. So the control plan will be able to recognize the node and workloads allowed to be running on, on the node. So on the runtime, the node agent send the CSR for a workload and the CSR request will be sent to the control plan by node agent API. Then we have an authenticator to validate the credential carried in the CSR. And then we check the identity registry to see if it's a valid request. Um, and the last step is uh, identity issuer will sign the certificate and send back to the node. So in this, this figure, we have a, so logically like a, we have an authenticator, or, or sorry, there's with um, approver and issuer, they, they work logically like a, a CEA. And uh, so this figure only shows like uh, we use the building CA. We can, we can also, well, we also want to support a pluggable CA, but uh, um, that's, that's what we have now. And the inner roadmap, right? So in our roadmap, overall roadmap, we want to do, uh, we want to be aligned with uh, Kubernetes and uh, we want to share the same implementation. Uh, right now the CSR is uh, pretty much the similar because uh, Kubernetes use a CSR to do a kubelet uh, certificate provision. And uh, also what we can do is uh, to share the CA implementation, um, I mean, in terms of building CA. Uh, as I mentioned- So when you say the CA, do you mean the CA that's, that pods trust or a different CA? Uh, this, right now, uh, Kubernetes has its own CA and uh, Istio has its own CA. So I don't see any different, any problem, that, any problem that this two CA cannot be combined. If we so we actually have, we had, so we had a really similar discussion like this in OpenShift and we felt really strongly that they shouldn't be combined. Maybe this is a follow-up, but it came down to, um, it really does need to be easy for the central cluster admin to decide which CA's pods should trust, which, um, which okay. would be combining CA's a little, in a different way than we do today. Um, yeah, we actually uh, thought about a similar problem too. Uh, that's the reason I think in the previous slides, Tall said the identity assurance should be a pluggable unit. So uh, we do see there are different use cases uh, uh, where you want to separate the workload so the identity from the Kubernetes orchestration CA. And there are also cases where you want to combine them. So like 
making the insurance unit plugable means that you can have your own route or you can plug into your existing Kubernetes route and uh, every certificate issued are uh, routed at the, same, at the same route as Kubernetes. So yeah. we want to support both cases. Yeah, and I, I, I bring that up because it's a scale problem that we put a CA into a service account secret today. So like OpenShift and some of our densest clusters have over two gigabytes of data in etcd that's basically just the CA. And so what we'd actually like to do like as a really concrete scalability improvement is move the, the CA that's delivered for the service account secret outside of secrets and have that come in by an orthogonal mechanism. And that then leads to a bunch of those other questions like, I'd love to be able to, as an administrator, define what CAs my pods should trust, um, which isn't, it doesn't, like, I don't think it obviates any of that stuff, but I think that is a very, that's a very pragmatic thing that we could target as a feature, which is it should be possible to control what CAs pods get across a cluster with either pod preset or with a cluster level scope thing. Clayton, I think the, the scale problems, if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, are, are like, just like the, the all, all the objects that are created, right? It's, it's not like the, the CA itself, it's the, it's the, all the objects created for each service account, right? The fact that you have one in every single service account object. Yeah. So, yeah and if, the, if you've got the, an intermediate, and if you've got that intermediate, then you've got the intermediate CAs in there. Oh, so okay. we, we have 4K, we have 4K of um, secret, CA data per secret, and we have on the order of uh, 150,000 secrets on one cluster. Right. And so that sort of stuff adds up. I think it would be like straight off the bat, like we want to go solve that in a way because the use case of what CAs should my workloads trust is not really a platform. It, it's not about the service account token. It's about an administrator or a platform or an application deciding which CAs should trust. And it opens the door for integrators. Right. So, I mean, the way we've talked about this um, kind of with Mike and, and Istio is we've, we've kind of discussed like, would it be possible to break out the, the um, Kubernetes kind of CSR process into like something separate that could be that Istio could use because Istio is essentially implemented of something very, very similar. Um, right. And share those and share those things. I, I'm not sure if that, I don't think that really addresses your secret kind of uh, just data problem. Um, but is it, how does that fit with your idea of kind of not sharing, not sharing the CA? I'm not sure I quite follow the logic. Well, no, I, I think the CSR is a great place because nothing about the, like CSR, there's nothing about the CSR that's tied to a particular CA or even completely disjointed trust right. domain. And I think likewise, the problem that someone looking at a cluster who wanted to put a CA into all pods on the cluster that they trust, which is a fairly common operational thing, is going to have to do that by abusing the service account secret speaks that there's just a functional gap. So we can queue that up as a, as a topic, but I think it's really worthwhile to say, like what TLS domains you trust really does come down to, um, really does come down to it's a platform feature to be able to inject those somewhat orthogonally to the service account secret. Okay, so uh, let's move on. So the next, uh, the, so besides that, we also want to leverage this working group to uh, uh, to to go with a, like the flex volume, like a CSI, and uh, we have a pluggable CA support and the pluggable identity, um, and also in terms of workload, when we do the node agent, uh, in terms of the node agent API, also we call the workload API. We have a um, we have a regular like a CSR, or we can have do the handshake API. So the hand, handshake API is an idea inspired by Google OS, uh, which hides the private key from the workload. So this handshake API only provides you the handshake related token, so which is a random string to the workload, and all the handshake process can be do uh, by the handshake service. And uh, we also have an Envoy KDS, which is a key distribution API, because right now. Um, the key uh, Envoy get a certificate from the lo local file. Um, if the file content changes, we have to add another agent due to, to uh, periodically monitor this file. 
and restart Envoy if necessary. So this is not good, and we we want we don't want to do this. Uh, we don't want to have this uh, listener. And uh, if we can do put the key and key and certificate into the KDS as an API, so every time the Envoy just query this to uh, do automatic rotation. And uh, also we want to use the uh, leverage the RBAC uh, of the Kubernetes to do with the uh, access controls. That's, that's pretty much what we have. If the Envoy uh, KDS uh, mm -hmm. gets implemented, yeah. is there any need um, to be uh, using other mechanisms to get key material um, onto the proxies? Well, it's, it's about the uh, flexibility. I mean, uh, and uh, it's also about how we implement, how we do the key um, distribution. So if we go with a node agent, we can let a node agent to be to implement our KDS API. In that way, Envoy just talk to node agent to get this key and certificate. But if we, when the other day we decide to use some something else to, to distribute the key and certificate, so the KDS API may be implemented as somewhere else. Yeah, I, I'm also not. I, I guess maybe you haven't decided yet, but uh, like I'm not sure. Like in the in the world where you have this KDS API, do do you still use the Handshake API, or is that kind of? Well, I, mean, I mean, there are alternatives. We haven't really decided yet. I mean, okay. And also for Handshake API, right now it's mostly for managing the Istio within the within the CCE. I mean, I guess even with the KDS API, you still have the bootstrapping problem. Like, uh, like how how does whoever is is on the other end of that KDS API verify that the envoy is is who it, who it says it is, so that it can yeah. then get the right key this, material? This is this is an existing problem, and uh, uh, the way we plan to solve this is uh, because the node agent, you know, is running at the same node or at the same um, the same part with uh, of the workload. So we can either use a like uh, people mentioned, like like UDS, or we use uh, some uh, PID to uh, to build up the trust. Do you see Istio as being installed on top of a Kubernetes cluster, such that that initial, like I guess, to maybe ask the naive question to tie it all back together? Do you anticipate wanting to be able to leverage the container identity to talk to external systems of record off the cluster? Because the node agent would be running, the node agent and the proxy would be running as um, containers. Uh, sorry, I, I kind of lost you. The uh, can you uh, repeat the question? Sure. So, is the um, uh, since the proxy is expected to be running in a sidecar, mm -hmm. um, and there is a node agent, did you plan on delivering the node agent as a data set or other workload on top of the cluster, or assume it was installed? And if it was d delivered on top of the cluster, like as a pod. Were you planning on using, or do you have the requirement to use the container identity of the where you're running as to then bootstrap the next level? Maybe this is a restatement of what Greg was asking, but. Uh, I mean, you mean you mean for a node agent to run it on Kubernetes pod? Um, I think I think what what we can expect is uh, to let the node agent to be running at uh, at one of the container and. Uh, and uh, about the uh, and the, the the envoy can just uh, let's say if they're they're in the same pod, so the security trust is is relatively uh, uh, secure. I think that's 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 uh, uh, I think that's what we have for in our mind. And also because uh, the other day I me I remember Yang, you also talked about discussed have this this discussion about the knowledge running on Kubernetes pod. Do you have any thought? Yeah? Uh, I don't think we settled with any concrete design. Uh, right, right. Ideas including like running node agent on each node as uh, like deployed by demo set. Or we can do plugging to the kubelet so that uh, uh, the node agent has more lower level node level information about the cluster 
let me talk with the API to know what are the parts being scheduled <laughs> on the particular node. But this is, this is uh, I don't think this has been settled on the SQL side. Right, right. And the daemon set and the, the communication, the communication security is, um, can we still do uh, use a UDS to do the, because it's a local node, local communication. Yes, this is about how you, uh, how you implement the flex volume to insert the identity inside your pod, right? So you could maybe implement flex volume backed by an UDS. So based on like uh, the, which UDS schedule like activator, you know which part of to the node agent. Okay. <laughs> So any questions? Yeah, I'm just trying to imagine this. So like with the, with the flex, so I think like the most interesting bit probably for this working group is like, is this discussion here like of delivering the identity and how you would want to get at it and how we could deliver it. Um, and I'm just trying to imagine like how the flex volume piece kind of fits with the handshake API. I mean, that, it'd be nice to preserve that property of, um, of the workload not having access to the key. Uh, I think that's, that's really nice. Um, but I'm actually not, I'm trying to imagine this. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, it, how it fits together. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else has, has, a, has a picture of that in their head. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Oh, um, yeah, I was gonna say like, I don't know either. I do think like if we accept as a given that hey, there's a diverse you? range of container workloads that are going to go and uh, to connect now? to other servers, that okay. the idea of if we don't have to force that to do the handshake API, but it is convenient. But even the things we were talking about to inject identity in a prototypical sense um, were the kinds of things that you could use to inject a UDS into, um, into the Envoy proxy in a secure way. Yeah, okay. Um, so we're, if there's any more questions for Tao, maybe I'll just give it a minute to see if anyone else wants to raise some or ha discuss anything else here about Istio and crossover with identity. Um, otherwise, we'll, we might move on to Mike and talking about uh, his doc. But there's a link in the agenda to that. Okay, I'm gonna take that as, let's move on. Um, so Mike, could you maybe kind of give us, give us the elevator pitch for your, <laughs> for your doc and, and then, we'll, then we'll dig into some details. Yeah, sure. Um, basically, um, sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit, but basically um, the, I circulated a doc the other week um, uh, I don't know if it's in the agenda yet, but I will paste it into the agenda. It's called uh, Verifiable Workload Jots. It's in there, yeah. What it does is it proposes um, uh, a method of extending the current Jot system in Kubernetes service count Jots to be more useful for stuff like um, integration with third-party identity providers um, and uh, proving to systems that are not Kubernetes um, uh, that you are a specific service account. So today with the JOTS, we have um, JOTS delivered to pods through um, a secrets mechanism. These JOTS are not time bound and they are not scoped and they have no audience. So they are very powerful because they are able to authenticate a service account against the Kubernetes API. Um, so they're not generally useful. Um, what, what I would like to see is for these JOTS to um, to uh, for to implement uh, to see to implement a mechanism that uh, allows a provisioning of service count jots that are very similar but have a um, expiration uh, have a um, and have an audience. So what that would allow you to do is for a system like Vault running on Kubernetes, um, you could build a jot proving that you are a service account and hand that to Vault um, and. Vault would not be able to turn around and 
use that jot um, to authenticate as you go against the Kubernetes API. So uh, the doc proposes two models of doing this. One model is um, decentralized where jots are built from um, an X509 certificate, uh, which is uh, essentially the pod identity certificate, which may or may not exist depending on what we decide to do with per pod identity or per container identity. Um, and the second mechanism is a centralized model where we build a API that is a non-resource API similar to um, token access review or um, subject access review uh, that is built into the API server that allows um, containers to um, request uh, scoped or uh, scoped and time-bound jots from the API server using the uh, using their container identity. So they would authenticate against the Kubernetes API, ask for a jot, turn around and hand that jot to whoever they need to prove their identity to. Um, so that's the general outline of uh, what was explored. Um, I'd like to get some feedback and get an idea on which model is preferable in people's eyes. Um, and then I want to um, turn that, uh, remove one of the models and turn uh, the model that is preferred into a design doc and propose that again uh, to the uh, community repo. So that's the, um, the elevator pitch. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm not sure if people have had a chance to look at the doc. It's, uh, and absorb that. I have questions for Mike right now. Um, I mean, uh, a big question for me is um, how uh, how widely deployed or or like how common are services that will um, be able to validate one of these decentralized jots, um, but don't um, just accept. Uh, X509 certificates. So like uh, Vault is, is a good example um, where you could you could use a JOT to, to validate against Vault, but does Vault just accept a, a TLS certificate in the first place? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm not uh, specifically sure about JOT, but I do know about the current Kubernetes JOT integration, or Kubernetes Vault integration, and it does use the service count JOT. Um, so there's a a fairly common OAuth pattern, which is the two-legged OAuth handshake relies on um, when the client credential relies on is very similar to um, the decentralized model with uh, extra validation. Um, so I would say that these systems are um, few that would work with this off, off the um, out of the gate, but I think that's to be expected. Um, Oh, uh, maybe, a, maybe a question would be, Mike, like, is there a, is some of the, um, the jot, like, does that, does that, do you use something like the decentralized model when you're attempting to, to, to solve or succeed at scale or reliability guarantees across multiple failure domains versus right. the centralized model where the reactivity and the centralization is valuable? Cause like, I'm just trying to like, analogize when I would use a TLS cert versus when I would use a JOT. And one of the reasons I'd use a JOT okay. is I want to actually, like I think there's a lot of use cases for on the Kubernetes side, turning JOTs into more scoped tokens um, and limiting right. those down Not to talk now. to other people in the Kubernetes ecosystem with, but that's more of a ecosystem integration play. There's other ways to do that. Um, we just don't have, there's no, there's no generalized uh, security solution that does that today, but you know a lot of the things in a in a rich ecosystem of tools need a way to go do that. I don't know that don't they require the JOT for the decentralization, except when it's infrastructure components that could potentially it. fail. But they very well might want it for the um, ability to scope and restrict uh, very aggressively. Yeah, I, I think. Um the couple benefits of the JOT are um, not even uh, excluding the de talk about decentralized or centralized model. Um, benefit of the JOTs are um, working with systems that do accept and um, 
uh, backwards compatibility with uh, our current Kubernetes API um, and uh, going places where TLS is not supported. As far as the centralized and decentralized model, the main benefit of decentralized, as you said, is uh, definitely availability and uh, potentially scalability. Um, obviously, if you have like a centralized job mentor that can be made HA by same way that we make the Kubernetes API server HA, um, the where you would use in a decentralized model where you would use a jot um, over a just presenting a TLS certificate uh, with client auth. Um, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I, it, I think that like the comparison of like jot versus TLS with client auth is, is maybe uh, a somewhat misleading comparison because like X509 certificates could be used in protocols other than and other than TLS and, and could just be payload in the same way that that jots are could be in practice though does anybody use them like that um, I am not sure um, yeah, yeah, I think and, and I agree I agree I just couldn't think of an example off the top of my head where I've ever generated a client a certain key and sent it along to someone not to say that like it couldn't but at least the jot does have that OAuth overlap, right? And some of the ideas of time limited, like you can time limit a TLS cert, but the complexity of an assertion, which is really all it got, is and a lot lower. So, yeah, I think those those say, are the I want. Those ahead, are the two things that that um, I think are are really uh, important distinctions about Jots versus X509 is that Jots kind of have this. Um, mechanism of scoping an audience and you know the ability to add additional claims kind of built in whereas like you could build that on top of x509 but there aren't any like standard extensions yet and um, you can propagate it which i think and i think that's the the key is non-propagation you focus on tls if you want to allow something to propagate to an audience uh in a controlled or uncontrolled fashion you would use a job yeah yeah, yeah I, I think like and just to be clear, like propagation, we're talking about, you know, pe people like to terminate TLS at their boundaries. Uh, it's very common, you know, like having load balances terminate TLS and that sort of stuff. And so then then they need like to have some way to that thing that's terminating TLS to carry through the identity that was presented in that certificate. And so that that's what the that's where the JOT is helping you here, that it, it gets to travel through that path. Yeah. And and so we have a couple of, like, just to, to tie this to some of the concrete problems in Cube that might give us ammo for what we might explore in the short term. Um, uh, API extension servers actually rely on um, TLS identity from the masters. Um, the Kubernetes masters also present proxy, a, a specific proxy TLS cert to the components that they talk to. So if you run, you know, Cube API service proxy or pod proxy or node proxy, the identity that's coming through is, you know, the system master proxy identity. There's a lot of things that we've right. talked it's about private. where there's it's a lot of, there's a risk in allowing those underlying systems to trust right. this all powerful right. proxy to talk sense. to them. Like, but there's a lot of incentives for people to go trust that. And therefore, you know, as we go forward, we might very well want to say the kinds of interconnections among the infrastructure, we want to recommend that you use this kind of identity um, for this use case, and we want you to use this kind of identity, you know, jots and assertions for this other use case. And, you know, it, it, we don't have to take any of these steps, but I, it seems like it seems like people are going to take bad steps unless we can offer some alternatives and suggestions. So either way, we have to have something. And by bad steps, I mean... Does the design call out uh, kind of the changes that would be required in the... Cab capabilities that the API server would provide for both of those scenarios, Mike? Uh, like I'm, I'm thinking of, um, like you would need to move signing keys into the API uh, if you make it a centralized mentor. And then you either need to have like well-known publishing points for the keys for uh, consumers to verify signatures, or you have to have a verifying service like token review or something. Um, yeah. Um, token review would definitely support uh, validating these tokens. Um, the uh, So actually, this is only for the 
or this is for the um, centralized model that I'll speak on first. Uh, we would need to move signing keys into the Kubernetes API, and we would want to expose some endpoint that had a list of the public keys that are currently uh, that valid JWTs can currently be signed by. Um, and um, in the decentralized model, I think only we only need to change the uh, token review API to um, in the presence of expiration and uh, audience uh, in this presence of expiration uh, uh, validate that the expiration has not expired when a token is um, presented and it would be up to the um, up to the consumer of the shot to to validate the audience is correct uh, I'm not sure I think we would need to make audience part of that uh, because token reviews are used to delegate authentication by add-on API servers today and so uh, those servers are basically checking, is this a valid API token? Um, so I think so how we would make part? audience part of, probably make audience part of the spec. So validate this token for this audience, and if the audience is unspecified, then it is implicitly for the API server. Um, okay, so yeah, that would work too. Is there a concern uh, about moving the um, signing key into the API in the centralized model, other than um, the obvious concern of, <laughs> Isn't that, no, I mean, that's effectively what, I mean, it's very close to what token review has to do today, no, which today, is. Today it has verifying keys. So there, right now, the API server doesn't have to have access to any signing keys. So the CSR signer and the service account signer, um, those signing keys can be held closely, really externally, like, and you can like, run those controllers from you know, a more protected location. And um, but if you compromise, API, it, is it worse than the master serving key? Like, the, is it worse than the master serving cert on the API servers, which all API traffic goes through, including all token reviews, all CSRs, et cetera? It depends on what else you're using to sign those things. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Give, presumably uh, the, the serving key doesn't give you access to uh, sign things. Right. Normally you have a serving cert that only lets you serve. So even if you gain access to that, you can control that DNS name, but you can't go mint other things. So you can arbitrarily alter signing requests. So I think that there is a path towards separating the privilege of um, the chat signer from the API server process. Uh, we can just use uh, either a cube aggregator framework and to have a um, dedicated uh, jot minting cube aggregator um, mm -hmm. that is more protected or we can use something like a webhook API that is synchronous. Um, yeah, I, I didn't want to rattle. I, I just, I, I also at some level, yeah. the, the theory of if you can intercept every API call, is there any difference between what you can do and effective root on the cluster? And the answer is no today. Right, Not but again, sure. with signing keys, it depends on what else you're using those for. Yeah, yeah. Presumably imagine the a signing key that has scope beyond Kubernetes. Right, exactly. And, so and that's fair. Agree, Clayton, uh, like you, you own the cluster, but if you own the signing keys, we don't know what else is associated with this. If this is an intermediate that is in your you know, corporate PKI, uh, and you can now mint things that are recognized by other parts of your structure, that might not be great. Yeah. So that I just want to call those things out and kind of weigh, weigh those as we're deciding between these approaches. Sure. We definitely need to figure out how to protect that. And Mike, in the decentralized model, what are the what are the corresponding advantages trade offs there? The um, main advantage is, um, in, in my opinion, it, and is the um, the uh, uh, high availability. Um, I'd actually consider that to be um, the only advantage. Um, it's they, uh, as far as 
validation, the decentralized model, in my opinion, is actually much more difficult to validate um, these jots just because um, there's a lot of extra constraints that that are kind of non-standard as far as shot validation um, in the decentralized model. If we use something like the token review to validate these jots, we kind of, um, if we have decentralized minting and uh, centralized validation of jots, we're kind of in the same place that we should have just gone with centralized minting. Um, so I think clients will need to be much thicker in order to, um, uh, in order to validate uh, jots in the decentralized model. Um, there's a, there's obviously, you know, that increases the room for error. Um, in the decentralized model, um, the validation flow involves trusting the intermediaries, right? Like verifying against the intermediaries, which means you have to have the intermediary identities in the chain or, because I, and I'm a little hazy on some of the details, it's been a week or two yeah, since I, I mean, went to the doc. It ends up looking very similar to X509 chain validation. Yeah, where you basically have to trust you trust the container and then you trust the node and because you trust the node and the API server says that the node is still trusted or hasn't effectively revoked the node's identity therefore you can validate yeah so if you want to do something like that uh, you maintain I guess uh, C CRL uh, walk up your x509 chain that is presented inside of the jot you do um, whatever validation rules um, that we deem are necessary to validate these jots, and potentially you need to parse the X509 certificate and look at some custom extensions um, to convey uh, constraints like this um, certificate is only, only allowed to create jots for this um, specific um, service count. Um, something like a name constraint, which is um, undefined for non-CA certificates um, inside the X509 spec. Um, and then you come up with a validation decision. So that would be a, a distributed. So all clients would need to implement that logic. Um, it seems to me that between the two models, the, the threat model and attack surface is actually quite different. Uh, have you thought or analyzed any of this? You know, for example, what happens if you have a remote execution on the node or you lose the, the node or whatever, right? So have you thought about these differences at all? I mean, I, I, I'm not looking, I haven't looked at detail to understand, but I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Right. Um, I think in, in both models, I think the best that we can do um, is to get to a point where if you have root on the node, you can pretend to be anything that is running on the node. Um, if you have root inside the container, you can pretend to be the container. I think that's where we want to get with both. Um, the As far as uh, dif difference between attack services, I don't think it's on the workload side. I think it's more on the uh, control plane side. So um, we expose a larger API surface in the uh, jot minter um, and we would if we had a system that uh, provisions x509 certificates already um, and we need that along with the jot minter we have doubled our surface of API um, whereas if we weren't with the decentralized model we would only need to really secure the x509 provisioning and maybe that's another question too, which is like on the X509 stuff, like the X509 is very useful just because you have an identity that never leaves the container. But if you do that, then... We lost you mid-sentence, exactly. I think we lost you. <laughs> Sorry, I was muting. Um, I was just saying, like, the idea that we want to have a TLS identity on the container side that doesn't leave the container that could be used for the non-propagating form of identity. I guess maybe that's maybe my core question is if we think that we want a non-propagating identity that could still be used, then the verification side of the X509 identity is going to be something we have to think about no matter what. And if we think that we can get away completely without a without a non-propagating identity, like a j jots or whatever it is, then um, 
that we can bypass the entire X509 infrastructure, but we won't have a non-propagating identity. I'm not sure about that. It's because uh, there we have some well-defined validation for X509 or TLS already. Um, that validation is not well-defined in the JOTS in in service count jots uh, signed by x or certificates um yeah i think that's an where, important point about yeah. the threat model is like do we consider um all the the validation of of these things in scope of of what we're talking about with the threat model or do that's, we say well you know that's that's somebody else's problem no i i think i was just about to say exactly the same thing i i i, I think that um what Mike's pointing out is that, you know, having to understand like the entire kind of issuance chain when you're, so if, if it's the, the consumer of the JOT that has this kind of like X509 chain in and if it's their responsibility to walk that chain and know all about kind of what that means and, and do all that validation correctly, I think, I think people are already kind of not doing JOT validation correctly in a lot of cases and ha adding, adding all that extra complexity there, I think is, is actually probably the biggest kind of security risk to to that approach more than because I think Mike's right. Like once you have root on the node, I, I think that essentially means in either of these schemes that you get to be the identity of that node. So it's more about like um, how are people going to fail consuming these identities? Um, you know, you know, by by doing the validation wrong and and there being being bugs in that uh, or or just like logic flaws in that, which I think would be very easy to do with this more could, complicated kind of Could we turn it around and say, well, if the strength of TLS is verification is a more well understood problem and the strength of JOT is centralization and use cases that require fine grained control, but verification is hard. Should we say that container identity for TLS is the decentralized model and JOTs are the centralized model for, like a JOT model is when you want to do Validation is complex, but you could do more fine-grained things. That's fine. Put that behind a black box somewhere. When you want to do decentralization and high availability, the TLS option is just strictly better because that's something people understand how to validate and scale today. Uh, you do get the termination issues with TLS. Um, so if, if you want to do decentralized TLS, you're committing... But is it, plumb is that a feature? Isn't that a feature of TLS though? Like, which is you pair the two strengths. I mean, like in a sense, like literally, like if you want a non-distributable identity, then you do need to make it more powerful. And if the one you want to cross out of boundaries and go really decentralized, you need to hop out to effectively what is a higher level authority that controls more domains than just the domain you're in. Like, cause there's nothing that prevents you from play. Yeah. And we can tunnel TLS over TLS. I mean, it's not like, it's not like we can't, you know, I think, in, and maybe this is me reading into the Istio stuff, but I know that we had discussed TCP over Istio at one point. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> or, or, or the idea, at least, of channels over channels for the, I mean, like VPN, yeah, right? No, like, turn this into a VPN problem. Like, the TLS, if you want to do TLS cross validation across many different failure domains, you run the network connections that allow you to reach across all those domains, and then you distribute the identities for you know, the worldwide availability and you have a slower verification or propagation, but it's a, it is a, essentially can be made resilient. I mean, if, if you're asking for distributed validation of signatures, I think you're going to have a much better chance of that with TLS. Um, just because given, given your roots and your intermediates and your certs, like in your handshakes, like that, that has a better track record than JWT. Uh, signature verification. Um, I I don't know. I mean, it, you you can accomplish the same similar things with both uh, if you're willing to expose enough and make clients work hard enough. Um, and Mike, you had brought up earlier too, like you said that the black box the black box bearer token is one of the advantages of the centralized model because it looks no different. Um, or, or sorry, the JOT looks like a bearer token, and so if we treat the JOTs like black boxes more or less. Um, we can experiment with them in a controlled way, iterating up um, with the potential addition of this external way of injecting 
jots if necessary or having a jot endpoint that a workload could call. But it's not like it's not like we would have to change everything in order to make that model to experiment with that model. Yeah, exactly. And the other and another advantage that is related is that um, it is not gated on any development on um, any progress on X509 identity for containers. So we can actually experiment in parallel with the work that is going on in this working group. So I, I, I kind of wonder. Uh, sorry, CJ. One, one last note. Um, the uh, container um, identity is still used to uh, authenticate against the JOT minting API. So um, the root of trust is still the container identity. So what I was going to say, I, I kind of wonder if the JOT minting case is a specific case, a fairly common specific case of exchanging like the one true identity that we want to believe in for a more useful identity for external systems. Like does this also extend to, would we do a similar API for uh, plugging into Kerberos or other identity systems? I think it is. Kerberos is an interesting one. I would say Kerberos probably is going to be much more like a node agent. Like you effectively authentic. Uh, yeah, we can go back to Kerberos. I, I do think for the other one, CJ, yes. Kerberos is always a weird case because it basically mirrors everything we're talking about here. I, I think it is very similar to an external integration uh, from pod identity or where trust is rooted from pod identity. Uh, what makes it different is that um, we support JOTS already. Um, so we have some compatibility uh, requirements um, to continue to support these. Um, and uh, it is so, generally useful and fairly widespread spec. Hypothetically, if we said that the decentralized JOT extension model, if Today, we could go experiment with that, and this is basically what was being said before. If we experiment with that in the direction of you can exchange your service account token for a JOT, allows us to prove out the concept, and then in theory, in a model where we replace the service account token with a, a private key or something like that in the container, then the model should be orthogonal because we had always talked about being able to make calls against the Kubernetes API with your container identity. Yeah, yeah, I think that's... That's what Mike was getting at too. And, and so uh, I guess I see two models of getting a, an identity to interact with another system. There's either you're like, it's, it's pushed into your container magically by something like a node agent, or you have your one existing identity that you exchange through some trusted API to get your other identity. And so it sounds like the, the JOT model is probably well suited for being a poll. I don't know enough about Kerberos to, to say why that would be better as a node agent push type thing. Kerberos is much more like X509. I mean, the, the, it, in a sense, Kerberos is hiding a lot of the details of the tickets under the covers. With the tickets functioning as your revocation notifications in a sense. So, I mean, you've got, it's basically a bridge between the two systems. Like you have identities and cryptographic identities that are then exchanged for short running identities that are then passed across the wire, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So could you use the, uh, if we did have X509 private key container identities, could you use that as the, like, could those be the exact Kerberos long-lived identities? Um, generally what you would do actually is that the Kerberos agent would probably drop in alongside the X509. Um, Cause I have to go back and look. I don't actually know that you can get an X509 out of a Kerberos system. But uh, the Kerberos, when you authenticate with a Kerberos system, you are effectively getting what is what is essentially a private key in some form that lives on your machine. Um, and then the individual the individual agents are then you know cryptographic variants of that core identity. So it, it's almost parallel to an X509 injection. Okay. Sorry to sorry to tangent derail. I was just trying to see if this was kind of a generalizable thing that we could look at. Yeah, and I put Kerberos on there because it's just a good example of something that works. I don't think it should, uh, we can maybe attack Kerberos separately from the next one, which would be like a vault style identity exchange or something. Okay. 
I think we're out of time almost. Yep. Greg, do you want to yeah. wrap it up? Yeah. I'd be happy I, to, um, if people reviewed the doc uh, who haven't reviewed it yet. Yeah, I, I think we'll just call it here. Um, I, yeah, we'll, we'll sort out the agenda for the next meeting on the mailing list, I think. So yeah, thanks everyone.